Hi, and welcome back to Computer Science Theory. Uh, this is comms W3261 theory. Theory of computation at Columbia University, summer B 2021. And this is lecture two, where we'll be doing regular operations. And also talking about non determinism. getting into some really fun stuff today. And we'll probably do it in three parts. So this is part one of three. Um, if you haven't seen lecture one, probably go back and watch that. Uh, although we will do a little bit of review today. As always, I'm Tim, you can call me that. And I'm gonna write down the course website URL again, just in case you don't have it. This is where all the resources for the course are. This is where I'm going to post the problem sets. I'm also going to post link to this, links to this video and all other videos. I'm going to post these notability notes for this video and also the ones for the in-class lecture. So all kinds of resources there. Go check it out. That's twrand.github.io slash 3261.html. A couple of quick announcements. As of the day I'm recording, which is Monday, homework one is now up on the website. And it is going to be due uh, Tuesday, uh, the 6th of July, 2021, at 11.59 PM. And I know I promised every homework would be due on a Monday at 11.59 PM. But I can't do that this week because we have a university of holiday on the fifth. So enjoy the extra day. It also means we'll only have one class next week. So if you're watching this on Wednesday, don't come to class on Monday. Uh, what are we going to do today? Let's see. We're going to start with a quick review of what we talked about last time. It's going to be a short review. If you want a longer review, you can watch the in-class video posted on the courseworks or you can just go back if you're on YouTube anyway, you can go back and watch the second half of lecture one, which is where these topics are gonna to come from. We are going to introduce these cool operations called the regular operations. And the idea here is we defined something called regular languages last class. Regular languages are the languages recognized by a DFA. Currently our only procedure for recognizing a regular language is to go ahead and write out a whole DFA that recognizes it. Regular operations will give us another tool for proving that languages are regular. In particular, they'll let us cumulatively build um, whole lists of languages that are regular and simplify our job quite a bit once we've learned to use them properly. In particular, um, I'm going to prove that the regular languages are closed under union. That means if you've got two regular languages, you take their union, uh, the union of those two languages is also regular. You don't have to write that down yet. We'll get there in a bit. Don't worry if it didn't digest immediately. Then we're gonna take a break. In the second part of this lecture, I'm gonna introduce a new type of math machine called a non-deterministic finite automaton NFA. And this is a, I mean, non-determinism is quite a cool concept. This will complement the automata we introduced last time, the deterministic finite automata. Um, where this determinism is coming from, you might be familiar with determinism versus free will in a philosophy class. Determinism is the idea that the current state of a system fully determines the next state of a system at the next moment in time. And that is true for the deterministic automata we've seen so far. Uh, if you're at a certain point 
and you see a certain input on the input string, then we have a transition function that tells you precisely where you go next. However, that's not going to be true, or at least not so strictly true for the non-deterministic finite automata we'll see today. Finally, we'll take a second break, and then we will do our last proof. We'll prove that any NFA can be converted by a procedure that we'll talk about into a DFA that recognizes the same language. So, I mean, that might seem like a downer, honestly. We know DFAs can do certain things. They can recognize certain languages. They can recognize the regular language, regular languages. If NFAs can be converted into DFAs, it means that any language recognized by an NFA can be recognized by a DFA, and therefore the languages recognized by NFAs are all regular. Uh, but in fact, that doesn't mean that NFAs are totally useless. In particular, they will be able to represent, to recognize certain languages using a lot less space. They'll make our lives much easier. So in the sense of recognition, they might be no more powerful than DFAs. But in the sense of efficiency, complexity, the size of the automata we have to write down on the page, they will do us some favors. In particular, they'll help us prove things about regular operations that'll come in handy. So that's the structure for the day. And again, I think these four and five will probably be in subsequent videos that'll follow up on this one. So our quick review. We've gone through a lot of concepts very quickly um, and used a lot of notation that might still be familiar and buzzing around in your head. So that's why I'm going to do this, even if you just came in hot off the last lecture. What did we learn last time? Well, if you remember our kind of 10,000 foot view, our really zoomed out view, we learned languages are sets of strings. Moreover, languages are sort of like concepts. I'll say math concepts because there's a lot of nebulous definitions of concepts floating around in the world. We also define DFAs, deterministic finite automata. DFAs specify a procedure for deciding whether or not a certain input string is in a language. We built these little math machines and these math machines are concept recognizers. You feed them a little input string they do their deterministic thing. They run the string through, they end up at a certain state and they tell you yes or no, I accept or I reject. This string is or is not in a certain language. What do we call that language? Well, the set of strings recognized by a DFA D also known as LD, is the language recognized by D. That's all of lecture one in a nutshell. Languages are sets of strings. DFAs are little boxes of math that specify a procedure for deciding whether or not a string is in a language. That means each DFA recognizes a certain language. Um, and recall, of course, regular languages are just those recognized by some D. 
DFA. Remember we said last time that this is not true of all languages. Some languages are not regular. And of course that implies that we'll get to languages at some point where we can't recognize all the strings in the language, at least not using a DFA. We might be able to if we use something more powerful, but you should already be thinking about those irregular languages as somehow mysterious, somehow complex, somehow interesting or hard. Those are the kind of words we're gonna to use to describe them. I'm also gonna rewrite the definition, the formal definition of a DFA, because it'll be handy to have it to refer back to. And of course, with a big five tuple like this, you can't write it enough times. It'll gradually sink into your head to the point where these five things are second nature. So definition. A DFA is formally written as a five tuple, Q, sigma, delta, Q zero, F. If you knew what those things were already, you're doing great. If not, this is where Q is a finite set of states. Uh, sigma is a finite alphabet of symbols. Delta is a function that maps from Q cross Sigma, that is all pairs of a state and an alphabet letter to the set of states. It's called a transition function. And it takes a state symbol pair and gives the next state. Q0 is the start state. And F is a subset of the total set of states and it's all of the accept states. Why don't we make that sense? There we go. So that's our formal definition of a DFA. And of course, we had another way of representing a DFA, a state diagram contains all the same information as the five tuple. For example, on the alphabet, sigma equals zero, one, two, we could have a state diagram that looks something like this. We could have, let's see, QO down here. We'll make that our start state. Every state diagram should tell us where we start. That's the QO part of our formal definition. I have a couple other states. Q1 up here, a Q2 over here. And the next requirement is our transition function. We have to make sure every state has something to do on every input symbol. So in particular, no, not an A. It's not what I want. On a one, we'll go from zero to Q0 to Q1, from Q1 to Q2, from Q2 back to Q0. On a two, we'll go the opposite direction, Q0 to Q2, Q2 to Q1, Q1 to Q0. And of course, we've got to define what to do on a zero. And on a zero, we'll just stay in the same place. So we've got this nice little symmetric sort of cyclical 
uh, state diagram here. And I'll just tell you what the language is that it recognizes. Um, it's kind of an interesting one. This recognizes all the strings W such that sum of the digits of W equals zero mod three. And now you can kind of see where the cycle structure comes in. It's kind of a neat visualization of modular arithmetic, isn't it? Like we start at Q zero, which means we're gonna accept on the empty string. And then, well, you can certainly see how adding one works, right? We go into the residue class one modulo three, then two modulo three, then three modulo three, which is the same as zero. We go the other way. If we start adding twos to our sum, we go from the residue class zero mod three to the residue class two mod three, add two, roll over to the residue class one mod three. Of course, the zeros are sort of self-explanatory. You stay in the same residue class when you add a zero. So this is the first DFA we've seen, I think, that has anything to do with summation or maybe anything that has to do with what you might traditionally think of as a math problem. So a little intuition there that our DFAs can do math. Maybe they can do math well. I guess we'll find out later. But that's our review. That's our DFA definition formally and state diagrams. That's everything we did last week. All right. Let's get on to some new stuff. I promised I would tell you about regular operations. So the idea here is that regular languages we defined them above are those recognized by a DFA. How to prove this? Well, right now our only method is show a DFA. That is, if I give you a language and I ask you, prove to me that it's regular, the only way that we know how to do that right now is to write down either a state diagram or a five tuple of a DFA and then demonstrate that that particular DFA recognizes our given language. But it sure would be nice, you know, as computer scientists, we're lazy. We like to repurpose our past work. Sure would be nice if I could refer back to things I've proved in the past and use them to prove that new languages are regular. So to make our lives easier, for example, it would be nice to say things like if A and B are regular, C is also regular. So then you don't have to do it again every time, right? You just got to prove A and B are regular and then you could see thrown in for free. And if you could do this in sort of a regular memoizable way, you can get a whole library of operations that allow you to build, you know, whole piles of regular languages. That's what we're going to do next. We're going to define a few operators with this property. So some regular operators. Uh, well, we have union. This is, I mean, let A and B be languages. What are languages? Well, they're sets of strings. So what's a union of two sets? It's exactly what you would expect it to be. Um, this is the language of any string X, such that X is in A or X is in B. 
regular old union. Likewise, we can define a concatenation operation. And now, unlike with strings, we really will use the little bubble. If we have two languages A and B, then A dot B, A concatenated with B, is defined to be X, Y, such that X is in A and Y is in B. And note, this is not quite the same as B concatenated with A, right? Because in this set notation we've written down, there is an order to it. If I concatenate A and B, I'm looking at the language of all strings that take a string from A and a string from B and put them together in that order. Uh, this new language doesn't necessarily contain A or contain B. It just contains concatenations. Of course, you know, depending on what's in these two languages, it might contain A and B, but that's not certain. It's just a new language that you can make from the previous two by applying this particular operation. And the third one we'll look at, I learned it as the Claney star after a guy named Claney, who I suppose wrote it down for the first time, but the book is calling it star now, which I kind of appreciate. It's too many names, we'll just clutter up what we're doing. So we'll just call it the star operation. And it's a unary operator. So usual operators like plus minus divided by take two or more operator, two or more uh, inputs. So A union B, union of two things, two inputs to the union operator. Concatenation, A concatenated with B, two inputs to the concatenation operation. Claney star is a unary operator. So it's an operation that you do on one language that we'll call A star. And the output, the new language you get is all the strings that look like this. So just to be clear, that is an X, X sub I. So it's all the strings that you can make with, by concatenating one or more, sorry, zero or more strings from A. So I can pick some integer K and then concatenate any K strings together, but I could do that for any K. So that's the Claney star and it's gonna generate some very big languages. And those are our three regular operators. We haven't proved anything about these operators yet, but we will in a second. Doing an example real quick. Suppose we have a language A containing the symbols, sorry, the strings red and blue, and a language B containing the strings cat and dog. What's A union B? Well, it's exactly what you'd expect. Red, blue, cat, dog. A concatenated with B. Everything you can make by taking one element from A and smushing it with one element from B. That would be red cat, red dog, blue cat, and blue dog. And then Claney star, the big one. A star, I mean, it's a whole lot of things. So first of all, it's the empty string. That would be if you choose K equals zero and you pick a combination of zero elements from A. It's also red and blue. That's one thing from A concatenated together. It is also red, 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 blue, 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 red, 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 and is gonna go on for infinity. All of those combinations you can make for some natural number k, k greater than or equal to zero. Um, it's not always true that the Claney star of a language is an infinite set. If you want, you can pause the video and think about what the exceptions might be. There's only a couple of them. If you take the Claney star of the language that only contains the empty string, any number of concatenations of the empty string is just the empty string. 
And if you take the Pliny star of the language with nothing in it, you also get the language with nothing in it, right? Because you can't choose any number of strings from the empty language. There's nothing to choose. These two things are subtly different, but most of the time they'll be trivial cases. It's just a, I'll write that out as a, give it a little comment marker and call it an aside. So those are our regular languages. And in the last part of this first section, I am gonna prove that one of these three regular operators does have the nice property we hoped it might have. In particular, this thing, if A and B are regular, C is also regular. We're gonna prove um, if A union B, if A and B are regular, then A union B is also regular. So whenever we prove a bunch of languages regular, we get their unions for free. I'm gonna use some slightly different words just for variety. Regular languages are closed under union. If you haven't seen this little, the phrase closed under before, it means exactly what we said it would mean earlier. Um, if A regular B, regular, then A union B regular. More generally, if I say a set is closed under an operation, it means you can apply that operation to elements in the set and you get things that are still in the set. That's what the closed under means. But if you want, you can just gloss it with this parenthetical. In particular, using the definition of regular languages, we can expand it slightly and write a third equivalent statement which is if A is recognized by some DFA, call it M1, B is recognized by a DFA M2, then A Union B is recognized by a DFA M. And remember, this is just the exact same thing expanded out because A being regular means precisely it's recognized by some DFA that we can call M1 if we want to. Um, So how might we go about proving this? We should probably start with a couple of arbitrary regular languages, A and B. We can assume you know, that we've got their DFAs M1 and M2 in hand. And what we'd like to do is build some DFA, big M, that recognizes A union B. So in particular, we want our new DFA to accept whenever one of our first two DFAs would end up at an accept state after reading in the input string. So here's the idea. We're gonna simulate M1 and M2 at the same time. And accept if either simulated machine accepts. And at any point in time, this is gonna require us to store a simulated pair of states, one pair, one member of the pair for M1, the other member for M2 as one state in our new DFA. So, if this blows your mind a little bit, it should. It's very cool. It's a much more powerful thing that we've done than anything we've done with DFAs before. So hang tight. We'll get through it. We'll talk about it. Here's the proof in more formal symbols. Um, let's let M1 be a DFA 
um, given by Q1 and alphabet sigma, transition function delta one, a start state Q1 and a set of accept states F1 that recognizes the language A, let M2 be a DFA. We'll give its DFA some parameters too. A set of states Q2, the same alphabet, although without loss of generality, we can make this proof apply to two different alphabets. Um, a transition function delta two, a start state Q2, and a set of except states F2 that recognizes B, A, B, regular languages. So this is exactly what we said up front. We want to build a machine M, Q, sigma, transition function delta, start state Q0, except states F that recognizes A union B. It accepts strings if those strings are in A or in B. Equivalently, if those strings are accepted by the DFA M1 or accepted by the DFA M2. And the entire proof is just the construction. I'm going to write down what these five things are. And we'll talk about them as we go. So the new set of states, each state is going to look like a pair of states. So it's going to look like a pair R1, R2, where R1 is in Q1, R2 is in Q2. So if we make that our state set, let's think about what our machine is going to be doing at any given point, right? At any point in the execution of our computation will be paused at a state. That state will have two components. Uh, the first component will be a state from Q1, and the second component will be a state from Q2. So in a way, every state will tell us where we're at in the execution of M1 and where we're at in the execution of M2. We're simulating both at the same time. Every state is simultaneously two states. And we've created a state for every single possible pair of states. So, um, you know, give me any state from Q1 and any state from Q2. And there's a corresponding state which um, is the pair of both of them in big Q. So obviously there's more states in this new machine than there are in our old machine. Things are getting more complex. Uh, our alphabet, that's easy. Sigma equals sigma. It's going to be the same alphabet as before. Um, we're simulating input strings that are over the same alphabet, A union B, so we can use the same alphabet. The transition function is defined as follows. So for each pair of states, R1, R2 in Q, and each pair of states, R1, R2 in Q, and each symbol, a in our alphabet. So again, transition function is doing what it should be. It's mapping a state and an alphabet letter to what? To a new state. We'll define delta on the input R1, R2, and A to be delta 1 of R1, A, and delta 2 of R2, A. What's going on here? Well, this is our simulation step. This is the critical bit, right? What do we want our transition function to do? Well, we want it to go to the first state, which is the next state in the execution of our simulated M1, right? Pretend we're in state R1. That's our marker for our simulated M1. 
and pretend we, well, we do have the input A. Go to that next place as if we were running the machine M1. Do the same thing for the machine M2. So in a way, these two components of our state Q are kind of operating independently. They're like two separate simulations. We're able to do this because we've blown up the state space and we have every possible pair as a state that we can travel to. Uh, our start state, Q0, what should it be? Well, it should be the start states of our two simulated machines. That is Q1, Q2, that particular pair. And then finally, the set of accept states. When do we want our simulation to accept? We want it to accept if either M1 or M2 accepts in simulation. So the set of accept states will be all pairs R1, R2, such that R1 is in F1 or R2 is in F2. And that's an inclusive or. Either one of those things is true, then that pair is in our set of accept states. So we've defined our machine. We just need to go back and it's sort of self-evident from the construction, but we'll talk for a sec about why it does what we want it to do. Why does this DFA recognize A union B? Well, imagine, um, an input string W equals W1, that's the first symbol, W2, dot, 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 WN. On each symbol, each component of our state updates independently to simulate M1 or M2. That is, suppose I've started at my start state, Q1, Q2, and I read in the symbol W1. Well, I go to my transition function and I say, hey, I'm at start state, Q1, Q2, and I just got the symbol W1. What do I do? Well, I go to the new state, that's given by W1 and Q1, whatever my M1 would tell me to do. And I also look at what M2 would tell me to do if I have the start state Q2 and I get the input symbol um, W1. And I continue to do that when we stop, um, we accept if at least one of M1, M2 accepts. And that's the proof. Zooming out, what have we done? We've just proven that if A and B are regular languages, their union is also a regular language because if A and B are both recognized by a DFA, there exists some DFA that recognizes A union B. Awesome. So the next step, don't worry, I'm not going to prove this this second, is to prove more theorems of the sort. Well, this will be the next one that we will prove at some point in the future. Regular languages are closed under concatenation. That's the little circle. And we'd like to do precisely what we did for union. The only issue is that it's going to be a little bit more complicated. If we look back at the machine we built to simulate M1 and M2, um, it seems like we might have to do something a little bit different to create a DFA that accepts all the strings in A concatenated with B, if A and B are regular languages. In particular, it seems like we're going to have to have our automata, our automaton, recognize the first string that's in the first of our two concatenated languages, and then at some point know when to jump and start reading in 
the second string from the second of our two concatenated languages. It's not obvious that we can just tweak this formula and make this happen. So it's not obvious that the regular languages should be closed under concatenation. However, they are, and we can prove it. To do that, we need a new ingredient called non-determinism. And we'll come back and talk about that in the second part of lecture two. Thanks for watching.